every meal has a story to tell. That is, if you're willing to look for it. I'm Danielle Pruitt, and I started Wild and Whole in 2016 with the express purpose of redefining our connection to food and exploring the qualities that make wild ingredients so profoundly unique. I'm cooking three different recipes. I am driven by curiosity, and my inspiration springs from harvesting food directly from its source. I've spent the past decade of my life trying to eat consciously, and believe me, it's not always easy. But it's pushed me to search in places I'd never expect for the most unpredictable of ingredients. I want to challenge your perception of what food is, where it comes from, and how those two elements are woven into our lives. Because connecting to our landscape through food means so much more than just the calories that sustain us. Welcome to Wild and Whole Sourced. Ask someone not from there what they know about Georgia, and they may tell you a number of things. That it's the Peach State, or home of Martin Luther King. But ask someone who hunts upland birds, and chances are good, they'll tell you that Georgia is synonymous with quail, specifically bobwhite quail. And I'm here to uncover why and how quail are such an integral part of hunting and cooking in this region. I've met up with Chef Kevin Gillespie, Top Chef All-Star and award-winning restaurateur, as well as hunting guide and dog trainer Durrell Smith to see if we could put a couple birds in the game bag. Durrell, this is my first time, well not just my first time hunting uh, in Georgia, but I've never hunted quail in, in this kind of terrain before. Okay. Uh, so I'm excited. <laughs> this is new. This is like a very this new experience for me. Uh -huh. So walk me through, what can I, what can I expect? Uh, as opposed to like what I'm used to, big open fields, are they are they gonna hold tight the way like we want them to, or like how jumpy are they gonna be? Like, what can I expect? <laughs> um, quail are, you know, wild bobwhites are very, very, very good holding dogs. Um, down here, it's kind of what we know them for. Um, they give your dog the style, they give your dog the opportunities. Um, it rained for the last few days uh -huh. and now it's kind of dry. So my thought is that around this time they'll be pretty hungry and yeah. trying to get out to eat. I like to look for nasty cover, blackberry covers, lots of thorns, stuff that's gonna shred you up. Um, and that's that's pretty much how it, how, how yeah. we do it. Now these are wild birds, so that they're gonna flush. They're gonna flush a thousand hard. different directions. Yeah, yeah, they're gonna flush hard yeah. and, they're, and, and get your shot off early. Yeah. Because once they're gone, they're gone. Yeah. And it's very hard to get them back. Yeah. yeah. So, but it'll be fun. We'll make it happen. All right. I'm excited. <laughs> Let's do this. Uh, let's do it. Let's do it. Part of what drew me here is the notion that there aren't any wild quail yeah, left I'm in Georgia. <laughs> but this simply isn't true. And interestingly, hunters are a large part of why they haven't disappeared. There's a long and established history of hunting this bird, and for good reason. Hang on, Go, go, go. And it oh, just flushed. Oh, yeah, that flushed. Right there. Yeah. Hold on. Watch it, watch it, watch it, watch it. Got him. We're making its way down and cruise maybe five feet and drop it down. We gotta go that way anyway. You're kidding. Wild quail are notoriously difficult. They're fast flushing birds with a penchant for holding in dense thickets and brush. So I'm not altogether surprised when we miss a few. Though as the day wears on, it's becoming clearer that we won't be filling out the bag limit on wild birds. Well, this is what we came for, yeah. right? That's right. I told <laughs> you, it was gonna it. be, you know, you, yeah. you get your exercise when you're hunting quail in Georgia. This ain't, yeah. yeah. No, I love this. I love that it's not a given. Yeah. Um, I love that I have to work for it because anytime Strategy. you work for something, you appreciate it more. And I think that's why I love hunting wild birds. I've, I've hunted a lot of quail in, in my home state and uh, I've had a lot of mornings like this too. You know, yeah. we call it gun hiking mm -hmm. yeah. um, where you just kind of walk around and come for a while. But, totally. uh, you know, the weather, it's just been raining nonstop before you got here. Mm -hmm. So we know they're hungry. Like we know that they're going to, but they may have gotten out super early. Um, I mean, that looks good. Like, that's the kind of cover that you would you expect. Yeah, right exactly. Um, we just need to be careful that we don't 
flush them early and then flush them out into this stuff and we'll never we won't yeah. see them again you know so yeah. but i i don't know I, I feel good now we're loose you know so yeah. we're like you know we were jumpy in the beginning we got out everybody's ready Everyone to go like now excited. we're excited yeah, yeah now we've calmed down we've aged we've matured a little bit you know so now's the time you know so. nice you made it count you made it count that was my last shell. Good dog. Right here, son. Right here. Uh, come here. Caught on the branch. There we go. Here's your lucky last shell. Appreciate it. You did you make that last shot this count. This was the I last know. shell. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah you said you were going to. Yeah. It's a hit. That was a good shot. It was it was flushing away. That was not a short range shot. So right. Good yeah. Job, man. There we go. <laughs> Good. <laughs> in Georgia, quail are a tangible reminder of the past and of folks' roots, culture, and memories, all of which are grounded in tradition. Which is why it's all the more difficult that wild quail numbers have fluctuated so drastically since the 1960s. I mean, the, the numbers are trending in the right direction for wild birds, but there was a time, you know, like my dad tells me, like when he was a little kid, uh, you know, he and his brother, they just grab their shotguns and they'd pick any fence row and they'd just walk it and they'd flush yeah. birds. Like, no dogs, nothing, you know? Mm -hmm. and my grandfather said it was even like, you know, they would flush 15, 20 coveys in a day of hunting, you know? Mm -hmm. And now you're like, if you see one, everybody jumps for joy. But I'm I know no there's kidding. birds here, you know? And, and I know they're coming back. I'm sure you have... You oh, know, you yeah. The numbers are trending up. Mm. Um, and in my experience, the last couple of seasons, I've actually been seeing more and more birds yeah. every season for yeah. the last two and a half, three years. And you think that's because more and more people are realizing, mm -hmm. I mean, it's gotta be private landowners, mostly mm -hmm. like, they're realizing the work that needs to be done to restore the habitat. I think that one of the things that has happened in Georgia, you know, we had a, a massive decline of all of our sort of wild game species in general. It wasn't just, you know, quail. Yeah. It was destruction of habitat. So the so the deer populations mm -hmm. went down and the turkey populations went down. But they're all on the way back up at this point. And I think a lot of that comes from the fact that um, change to the culture of what hunting is, like, and who is out there doing it and what right. they want to get from it. Yeah. You know? mm -hmm. um, I think that culturally people are starting to, they want, the, they want the challenge, they like the investment of time that is being put into improving the places that they hunt on, you know? Um, yeah. And, it, and it's, it takes some time, and that's maybe one of the biggest challenges for, for wild quail habitat is that it doesn't happen overnight. When I think about hunting in Georgia, I think quail is at the heart of it. Yep. So like, Absolutely. what is being lost if, if bob whites aren't here? Is it, it's not just like a loss of like hunting, um, it, there's just so much culture it's a and loss history of, right. around. Yeah. It's a like, loss what of cultural that? identity. If if, they, yeah. if there are no more Bob White quail, mm -hmm. there's an entire subsect of our history and our sportsmanship and our state's culture that is gone now, yep. that it's mm -hmm. just lost. You get rid of quail, my son ain't gonna be out there hunting. Yeah. Right? He's, a, right. he's not even a year old, but we keep quail. That's one more one more person we got on our team to be in the woods that I can teach him about you know about this. Yeah. And now we have another conservationist coming up. Yeah. I've been spoiled by the wild birds I've hunted in North Dakota. So much that I've never even been on a pin raised bird hunt. Today, Durrell has a dog with him that needs some training. And this is a perfect situation for that. Liberated birds provide a more controlled environment, one where Durrell can focus on properly establishing good fundamentals, such as holding steady and pointing. Of course, an added bonus is that we get an extra few opportunities to take home some birds for the table. I am the slowest plucker cleaner ever because I um, had this saying that you eat with your eyes mm -hmm. and people who have hes or reservations about eating wild game, the first thing they do is they look at it and if there's anything weird or off, they're like, 
they they immediately in their mind have a, have something about it. Right. And so I spend a lot of care and time when cleaning birds to make it look as beautiful as possible. Um, because that's what kind of what we're used to as when you buy meat from a grocery store, it's like perfect. Right. Wild game is not perfect. Right. And I just, I just, I just, and also taking time is for me is, um, I just enjoy it. Yeah. I'm never in a rush. Yeah. It's peaceful. It goes back to just honoring the kill. Yeah. Atlanta is a serious food city. The number of high-end, chef-driven restaurants in this town is striking, but there's more to it than that. It's a hub of Southern cookery, which by its very nature is endowed with hugely diverse culinary traditions. I'm here to meet Kevin at one of his restaurants, not only to get his perspective on cooking quail, but to hear why and how his background is reflected in his recipes. So we are at Revival, yeah. which I was at Gun Show the other day, and this is totally different atmosphere. <laughs> so why did we want to come here to cook the birds as opposed to Gun Show? Tell me, what is Revival to you? Yeah, it's interesting. So, you know, I had Gun Show first, and I think a lot of people thought about Gun Show as being very me. They look at me and they think, yeah, Gun Show, you know, loud rock music tattoos. But what they don't realize is that my culinary career was more influenced by the women in my life than anything. Um, I had two phenomenal cooks as grandmothers, both just unbelievably good cooks. And my passion for food really comes from them. And after having Gun Show for several years, I really didn't feel like I was um, paying tribute to that part of my, my life and my upbringing enough. I felt like the food that I grew up on, that home style Southern cooking was disappearing um, out of, because people find it inconvenient. It's, it's laborious. And I didn't want that to happen. And I wanted to make sure that I had a restaurant that carried the torch, um, the legacy of those women who had taught me to cook and taught me to love food. And so I built Revival for that reason. And I think that it, it's special. Uh, it's very, it, this restaurant is very special to me. The joke yeah. for years was always, if you don't like gun show and you say something to me, I'll be like, well, whatever. But if you don't like Revival, I might punch you in the face. Uh, it's um, very yeah, it's very personal because these, a lot of these recipes are my family's recipes. And so right. that's why I wanted you to come here because I wanted to show you, um, I wanted to show you a quail dish that I created. And then I wanted to show you one that I didn't create. That's a family recipe. That's a very old fashioned way of, okay. of handling quail. Um, I guess you'd say typical of the region. And I felt like serving it alongside this food. You, you know, you asked me, what is Georgia? And I was thinking about that. And it's, and it's different than what is Atlanta. You know, Atlanta is a very cosmopolitan big city and that's where we are. But Georgia has a really eclectic culinary history. Um, it's the coalescing of two very different regions of the South culinarily. They come together in this state. And I wanted to put that on a table in front of you. And this seemed like the place to do it. The menu Kevin's designed is rich, not only in culture and family heritage, but flavor. For the mains, we're talking about a traditional quail fricassee and a sourwood honey lacquered quail grilled over an open fire. We have our skinless whole quail, and we're gonna do two different recipes with this one bird, right? That's right, yeah, exactly. So, you know, traditionally Georgians, more often than not, use the boneless skinless breast. That's just like most of our recipes are based around that, but we don't wanna waste the birds by any means. So we're gonna do one recipe with just the breast, and then we're gonna use the legs, the thighs, and the, the whole carcass of the bird to do another. We start by deboning and preparing the meat for the fricassee. So this is A, it's in a heavy sauce. And so uh, it's really hard to eat with a bone in leg thigh. It would be very difficult. You need to fish your hand in the sauce and that just yeah. be kind of messy. But also, and really this is maybe the more important part, because of the way this is cooked, what we would end up with is really overcooked breast to get the leg thigh where we wanted it to. On the grill, things will come out a lot more even. In this, it, it's not a smart way of doing it. They so. cook at different speeds. Exactly. So it's better to just separate the cooking. Right, part. once this is boneless, this cooks ultra fast. Yeah. This still having bones in it, you're talking a very, very different rate of, of right. time that it would take, so yeah. So what all is in this? What do we have okay. here? So, um, so this dish, the backbone of it, aside from the quail, is this smoked bacon. Um, I want you to smell this. So this is real like old school bacon. 
So, oh, whoa, that is really smoky. <laughs> so this is from a guy named Alan Benton whoa. up in the mountains. Um, his, his family has been making bacon and hams for years. It's who my grandparents bought their ham and bacon from. I love connections like this. And the more we as a culture retain these kind of relationships with our farmers and producers, the better our food will be. This next ingredient is something that I really love to use alongside any sort of bird whether it be chicken or duck or any kind of poultry. And so these are hen of the woods mushrooms. Um, and as the name sort of implies, they have a chickeny like quality to them. Mm -hmm. They have a, a protein meatiness to them right. that is really great. I love, love mushrooms and any upland game. They're perfect. Together. Exactly. Well, it, it makes sense. You'll notice that we're tearing the mushrooms instead of cutting them. This creates more nooks and crannies for the sauce to occupy. And finishing the fricassee prep we crush several cloves of garlic, leaving them whole, and finally chiffonade some sage before moving on to our next dish, prepping for the honey lacquered quail. We spatchcock the birds by cutting the backbone out with the scissors and then smashing them flat with our hands. I like to just set it down on my cutting board here and then just kind of give it a, you know, a firm push down, almost like we're smashing our garlic. This provides more surface area for the meat to brown and allows the birds to cook quicker and more evenly. It's hard to overcook the leg thigh portion. It's really easy to overcook the breast. This allows us to grill it high heat fairly quickly and get a really evenly cooked bird. With our quail spatchcocked and flattened, we begin cooking the fricassee. The bacon is rendered out in the pan and the remaining crispy pieces removed. After this, the mushrooms are sauteed until just browned and then removed. Kevin sautés the shallots and garlic and browns a couple of sage leaves. I kind of just take my pan um, and I'll hit them in just on one side and that's about it, you know. So I'll knock a little. For? The flour is adding to that fond really more than anything. Not um, as a thickener. It will be, but we're going to actually add more. We're going to build oh, a okay. roux. So okay. I guess you could say it starts the roux out. But really what it does is compound those brown bits. That's what we're really, this recipe is a study in trying to get as many little brown flecks of things in it as right. possible. Now, we're going to cook this on one side. And this, honestly, we're not even really browning it per se because if we wait for this to be nice and golden brown, it'll be for the most part done. Sure. We're really just establishing a cook on this side of it okay. so that we have, um, so that the final dish has a bit more texture to it. And right. I noticed you didn't season the meat no, at all. No, not at all, not yet. And the reason is that bacon that we oh, talked that's about. Oh, a lot of salt. Got a lot already. of salt. So we're going to have to wait till we kind of combine it and let it leach its salt out before we adjust the seasoning of anything right. else in here. The pan is first deglazed with wine, to which Kevin then adds stock, cream, and a touch of butter. This combination is reduced and emulsified before he returns the other ingredients to the pan along with the oil. Just a little bit. So that's what we'll do. We'll get them into this. All right, Danielle, so these are our spatchcock quail. So I'm gonna have you cook these for us. So the way we normally do it, we season the meat side first with a little bit of salt, flip it over, put a tiny bit of oil on the skin side, and then season it with some salt as well. And then right onto the grill. Just a little bit to help us establish a little bit of browning on the meat. Grilling, doing some grilling. Just gonna kind of oh, cover covering. it with this heavy, this is a really, really heavy sheet tray. What I like to do, for me, I think that the best way to cook quail is to be as fast as possible. You know, really the longer they take, the, the more juice you lose, the more chance you run of overcooking it. Now just flip the birds over and we'll go back kind of on that straight, yes, look at that. That makes me excited. I like that. Golly, I like that. It's just, I still like get a kick out of it. I'm like, look at that, that looks so good. <laughs> Yep, we're gonna back flip over. it and add and bring back that oh, glaze. Okay, back side? Yeah, we're gonna, oh yeah. We need the front side and the back side. Gotta grease them up. The sour with honey lacquer is a blend of comfy garlic, vinegar, and honey that's been cooked down at least a shade in color. It'll give the birds an almost ethereal shine. We're careful to cook them no further than medium in order to preserve the tenderness and flavor that makes these birds so special. While the grilled quail rest, Kevin puts the finishing touches on our sides. Turnips and carrots in a dill sauce. Creamed potatoes, 
slow smoked greens, and his granny's cornbread recipe complement the two signature quail dishes, served, of course, with quail gravy. Meanwhile, we've invited Dorel and some guests to join us for what definitely appears to be a world-class meal. Kevin, this looks and smells amazing. <laughs> um, I can't wait to dig in, but first I just want to let you both know that I had a fantastic time, um, both hunting. I, I feel like it's such a special experience to be able to go find wild birds in a place where people think that there are no wild birds. And so that is incredibly special to me to be able to experience that and to be able to cook with you, Kevin. So thank you both for, for doing this for me. It's been an amazing trip. Thank you for having me and Cheers. showing me Georgia. Cheers. 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 Come back anytime you want. Cheers. I will. When we talk about hunting and food, we often talk about landscapes. But the thing I see here is a landscape of a different kind. It's just as real, but it's more intangible. It has a lot to do with memories. I have like more food than I can eat. This eat is it a Sunday in the South, Daniel. Is it? Yeah. <laughs> you make with the cherished hunting dog, the kind you make when you miss a shot, but most of all, the kind you make when seated at a table sharing a meal.